here. Great. And then now I'm live on both channels and hopefully that'll save me from having to upload this later. So we've got um, a lot of stuff to cover today. And what I want to do is I want to tell you a couple of stories and then I'll tie that in to the class lesson and you'll see how that goes. <laughs> so what I'm about to tell you could be true, could not be true. I will neither confirm nor deny whether I'm lying or not. <laughs> but a long time ago, back in the... Um, Back in the days before the internet, back in the days, some of you before your parents knew each other, and uh, I was a teenager on Long Island. I grew up, I was born in Brooklyn, and my family was part of, in, in Carroll Gardens, and my family was part of the great exodus, Italian-American exodus out of Brooklyn onto the suburbs of Long Island in the 1960s. So I grew up in a little beach town. Uh, in Suffolk County called Northport. And, you know, by the time I was about 15, I was playing in bar bands, like literally playing in clubs bef just about a couple of weeks before my 16th birthday. And so at one point, I was in this one band called the, let's call it the Free Spirit Band for lack of another name. And we were people that knew each other, uh, whether we were in high school together or some of the some of the student some of the band members went to Holy Family High School, which is a Catholic school in the in the township of Huntington, and but they lived in the Northport area, but we all knew each other, and um, we had a band together, and we played uh, we played a blues rock, we played the Allman Brothers, we played Muddy Waters, we played Jay Giles. Uh, we played all sorts of stuff and, um, we had gigs in bars. So in the village I grew up with in Northport, there was a bar called Wayfarers, which is still there, it's, but it's now it's called Napper Tandies. And it's a lot larger than it was when, uh, I used to play there, but we had a steady Friday night gig for about a year and a half. Every Friday night we played with this band. And we were really popular, not because we were good. Uh, we were popular because we were um, we were popular because we were um, in high school or just out of high school, and everybody knew each other, and it was a sort of like a meeting place for us. And I'm getting text messages, and it's like very distracting. I'm sorry. So I've got, I sh just. Sorry about that. So we used to play in, in this place, Wayfarers. And the, the bar was sort of set up into two areas. The back area was a, a big rectangle, big, big square room where the band was. And then as you moved out of that square area, there was sort of like a foyer area where you would enter. And then the back area was sort of long and rectangular. So when you looked at it from the sky, it almost looked like a T. You know, uh, except that the, the top part of the T was a little bit more square than rectangular. And it used to be so crowded that uh, over the Thanksgiving break, people would wait literally out in the cold for an hour, an hour and a half to get in. And in the square part where the band would play, in one corner, there was a pinball machine. And behind the pinball machine was sort of that foyer area. And as you walked into the foyer area, there were the men's and ladies rooms. And it was so crowded that if you were a guy and you were by that pinball machine and you needed to go to the bathroom, well, many of the guys would just turn around and urinate against the wall without going to the bathroom. So, you know, it's a, it's a Friday night and it's in the summer, so it's incredibly crowded. And the lead singer's name is, could, could possibly be Teddy. I could be lying about that. I don't want to, you know, get anybody a bad reputation. But it could be a guy named Teddy. And Teddy uh, came from a very, well, if that is his name, came from a very, very large uh, Irish, Polish, Irish, Catholic family. Like, there may have been 10 siblings. 
and then they were cousins and they were like uh, they were great guys if you were on their good side they were great guys they would like you know cut off their arm to help you you know seriously like really good people uh but if you did something negative to one of them then the rest of them were like your mortal enemies and so you know it's it's the it's so you, you imagine like the band is on a stage and Teddy's in the, in the middle. So we had, uh, uh, I was keyboard, so I was on the right. And then uh, there was a guitar player to my left. And then Teddy was in the middle. The drums were in back of him. And then on the other side of the stage was the bass player and the second guitar player. And then we also had somebody who played blues harmonica who sort of roamed around and sat, sat you know, had a microphone with a cable on it so he could stand and set up wherever he wanted to because sometimes he sang and he was the featured artist on the Jay Giles songs. So um, this one particular Friday night, some of Teddy's older brothers and cousins were there and they had commandeered a bunch of chairs and they had set up a horseshoe in front of the stage, right? So that there were people in back of them, nobody inside the little horseshoe and then us. So literally seven or eight feet the, the back of the horseshoe was maybe eight feet away from where teddy was standing and one of teddy's brothers who could or could not be named steve um went up uh to the bar to get a beer and when he came back there was a guy sitting in his seat and he you know he and the guy had some words the guy got up and they started, the, the words continued on for a little while, and we're in the middle of a song right now. So, you know, Teddy's up there singing, uh, and, and he's playing his tambourine, and we're rocking, and we're, everybody's, the place is going crazy. Like, it's literally, we were a horrible band, but we were, like, loved for some strange, bizarre reason. And so the next thing you know, the guys, you could sort of hear over the band, you took my seat. No, I didn't. Just get out of here. And behind... Steve's back who's seated in a chair this guy takes his bottle of beer and he, he's got it he, it's all, he must have finished it because he turns it over so that he's holding on to the nozzle and he's a, about to like strike Teddy's brother in the back of the head and Teddy sees this whole thing unfolding and it was like I was watching because at that point we could see it unfolding and with it was like slow motion Teddy just dove on top of this guy like a football player, you know, flying across the room, tackled him on the ground. And all you could see were like, were like fists going like this on this guy's head, beating him up. Right. And they like, like the, the brothers and the cousins picked this guy up and literally carried him out the door and threw him out into the cold or the summer. It was the summer, right? Threw him outside. And then, you know, we're playing up there and we're watching this. And one by one, the band stops playing, you know, and like we're sort of like there's this like fizzle out of the music. And we're sitting there like stunned, like we don't know what to do. And, you know, we're like kids. Right. And so then Teddy gets up and, he, you know, dusts off his shirt, tucks in his, uh, you know, does this kind of a thing, tucks in his shirt, picks up his tambourine, walks up and says, let's take it from the second verse. And then we picked it up and started playing like nothing happened, you know, so. That's, that's a story, right? I have lots of stories like that from my life playing in bars when I was a teenager and into my early 20s. Let me tell you another story. So it's um, January of 1990. So this is about 10 or tw like maybe 12 years after this incident I just told you about. And... I had just been on tour with a theater company called The Music of Andrew Lloyd Webber in concert. And we toured with a 35-piece chamber orchestra. I was the second key I was the keyboard player. They had a guy who just played grand piano and then I played uh, all the electric pianos and organs and you know keyboard stuff. And then um, we had it was like a chamber group. We had strings, French horns, woodwinds. We also had saxophones. And rhythm sec. We had a full rhythm section, and we had an uh, and and we had um, orchestral percussion, and just it was it was kind of cool, uh, except that the music was horrible. But it was it was kind of a cool gig. It was fun. We were on stage. We had uh, twelve really great singers, and Andrew Lloyd Webber's wife at the time was named Sarah Brightman, and she was uh, 
she had been starring in Phantom of the Opera on Broadway before that, and so she was the main attraction. And um, right before Christmas in twenty in nineteen eighty nine, I had gotten off the road and I'd come home for the Christmas break break, and then I was going to be starting rehearsals on January twenty eighth of nineteen ninety, about a month later, for Miss Saigon. So I'd been on the road on and off for about two years at this point, and I, I wanted a little break. Plus, I had also booked tickets to um, England uh, to go to London for four days because I wanted to go see the show from the house and then sit in the pit a couple times so that I could right next to the keyboard player so I could get a really good feel for what was going on. So, you know, it's, it's like a couple of days after New Year's. I forget the exact day. And I pack up and I go to uh, to London and I'm staying right by Hyde Park in um, in a hotel and I'm having a great time you know like it's 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 just you know I'd never been to London before it was it was cold but you know just the city's amazing and um, I had become friends I'd be made friends with the keyboard player one player in London for Miss Saigon, whose name is David Hartley, who's a very well-known session player over there. He's played on he, he's played on many, 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 many film scores. And if you saw the Elton John film at some point over the last two years, that's actually him playing all the piano parts on that. Uh, that's how good he is. He's really a great r- blues rock piano player, and he plays on all, all of Carter Burwell's film scores. He's tremendous. So... Um, it's it's I get up and my I have to get out to Heathrow. And it's it's a sad I think it's a Saturday. Yep, it's a Saturday. And I go I, I go to Hyde Park because I've got a couple hours to kill. So I leave my suitcases at the hotel. They assure me it's gonna be safe. And I had and I was and I started walking towards Hyde Park and like a naive fool, I had a waste pack with a, like a little, you know, one of those tiny little backpacks that you fit around your waist that you could put all your stuff in that were in vogue at that time. And I had my passport, my plane ticket, and all of my identification in there. The only thing I didn't have in there was about $75 in cash in my pocket. Or maybe maybe it was even less than that. And so I go to Hyde Park, and there's an... At that point, that was right before the Gulf first Gulf War started. So there were massive protests and there was a protest in Hyde Park. So it was unbelievably crowded and I was walking around and, you know, I wasn't getting too close to anybody, I thought, but apparently I got out of the park and I go to the hotel to pick up my stuff. And I realized that 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 pack I have is missing. So here I am in London about two and a half hours before my flight out of Heathrow back to New York City, Kennedy Airport, and I have no identification on me. I have no passport. I have no driver's license. I have no credit card. I don't have my plane ticket. I've got nothing. So you might think that I'm freaking out a little bit, right? So the first thing, and and also... No cell phones at that point, right? Pay phones. Got to look up phone numbers in phone books. So I'm frantically trying to find the phone number for the U.S. Embassy. And I'm talking to somebody at the embassy and they, they can't really help me out. But what the guy said to me was, just go to the airport and, and see what you can do. Have them call me here. And he gave me a number with his name. So I go out to the airport, I I take the tube, and like I'm thinking like, this is insane. I have no idea how I'm going to get home. And I don't know what I'm going to do, right? I mean, I don't even have enough money on me to buy another plane ticket. I don't have a credit card. I've got nothing. Imagine that happening today, right? You you couldn't, you know, you'd, you'd be messed up. So I get out to Heathrow. And I go up to the ticket booth, right? And uh, I, I, I go. I, I think I, I flew British Air, British Airways. 
So I go up to the British Airways, uh, you know, the term, the booth there at the terminal, and I start ta telling the woman my story, and she's like, well, I can't help you out. And, you know, I've got a really good me memory for numbers, um, like a really good memory for numbers. I can look at a number and remember it for a long time. And I had my credit card number memorized. I knew the date I bought the ticket. I knew exactly how much the ticket cost to the last cent. I knew that, you know, the, 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 the date, time that I left, time, the time, and, and I actually knew the flight number. I had, I had like all this stuff memorized in my head. So I'm sitting there with the, like with the agent, uh, the ticket agent, and um, she, um, she's saying, well, I don't know. I don't know if I can help you out. I said, well, look, I'm going to start telling you information about my ticket. Can you pop it into the terminal and you'll see that it's going to come up with, with, with all the right information. So I started giving her all this stuff and then she started playing along with me. And then she said, what, what's your credit card number? So I told her the credit card number. What's your date of birth? You know, blah, all, all this stuff, right? And I just started whipping off all this, what flight number? You know, when did you buy the ticket? When, where did you buy the ticket? You know, um, uh, like, uh, what time is your flight? What's the, you know, go, go, coming in? What, what time was that? You know, what was that flight number? Where did you fly from? All these questions. And I'm telling her all these answers because I knew the answers because I just, just know. And so... Um, She's looking at me. She's going, well, I don't know. I'm going to give you your ticket, but I'm, sh I'm not sure that you're going to be able to get on the plane, right? Well, I don't have a passport or any identification. How am I going to get on the plane? So she gives me the ticket, and I'm waiting online there. And basically, I get up to the person who's going to take my ticket, and she doesn't ask for any identification at all. Like nothing. She just takes the ticket. Okay, go in. <laughs> and they're like, so I'm walking onto the plane. I'm like, what? What just happened? How did I get on a plane without a passport or any kind of identification at all? They're like, you think that's happening today? You know? So I get on the plane and on the way home, I'm thinking, how am I going to get through customs? Right? And so I'm, I'm like, you know, five, five and a half hour flight back to New York. I'm, I'm freaking out. So I had managed to call friends of mine and tell them what the story was uh, on Long Island. And I said, you got to meet me here because I'm not sure I can get through customs and you guys might have to vouch for me or something. Right. So these two friends of mine, you know, they, I, I, I was hoping that they were going to be waiting for me. But anyway, on the, on the ride home, flight home, you know, I, I was like shaking. I was so nervous about, you know, what was going to happen to me when I got off the plane that I had started drinking some beer. I didn't have too much, but I don't really drink at all, like at all. And, uh, you know, so it calmed me down and it relaxed me. And then when I got to New York, I'm getting off the plane and I'm thinking like, uh, you know, like what's waiting for me with customs here. And then basically nobody ever checked me. And I just walked through like uh, I was minding my own business, like I knew what I was doing. And my friends were waiting for me. And uh, yeah, they picked me up and I came home. So, you know, I flew from London to New York with no ticket in my hand. No cell phones, no internet, nothing. I basically talked my way onto that plane and that flight home. And that would never happen today, right? So that's a, that, those are a couple of stories, right? I hope you found them entertaining. You know, imagine like you guys, jazz music graduates, you know, you're doing a gig overseas and you lose your passport and your credit card and your, and your driver's license. How do you think you're getting on a plane? You know, today that's not happening. But back then it was a different world. And I feel sorry that you guys don't have, will never experience that world. Uh, okay. So stories, 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 stories. So you guys for the final have been given material and you're going to be you've your goal is to use that material to fashion a story now typically in most of the music that you listen to or that that most of the music that you listen to which is song based um, well I might be making an assumption on that but is based on eight eight bar phrases, so song form is 
A, A, B, A. It's verse, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, breakdown, short verse, chorus repeating over and out. Uh, it's a 12 bar blues that repeats over and over again. It's 16 and 16. So it's A and A prime when the 16 repeats. Maybe the cadence is a little bit different. And that's sort of typically pretty much how songs are formed. Now, occasionally you get things like that are a little bit unusual. So in film scoring, we looked at Yesterday by Paul McCartney. And we saw that the verse of, Paul, of, of Yesterday is seven bars long and not eight bars long. Um... So that's a little unusual. And if you if you listen to progressive rock, uh, forms there are very abstract. Uh, if you listen to freeform jazz, the form there is very abstract. You know, by the time that Coltrane got to um, Ascension, you know, what was the form of that? I have no idea. Uh, but just in general forms that we're used to utilizing have four, two, four, even numbered measures. They're eight, you know, eight bars for a verse. That's typically what we're used to hearing. And so you can choose to fit your material into that kind of a structure, right? Which is one way that you could play it. Or you could possibly be a little bit more adventurous and do something that's a little bit more abstract with the structure and think of a through line instead of those anchor points of verse, verse, chorus, verse, right? You think of a through line and how a story unfolds in a through line. So what do I mean by that? Let's go to the videotape. All right, so a story has five basic but important elements. These five components are the characters, the setting, the plot, the conflict, and the resolution. These essential elements keep the story running smoothly and allow the action to develop in a logical way that the reader can follow. So in the stories I told you, the last one, I was the character, right? I was, and the setting was London. And the plot was, how was I going to get home? The conflict was, I had no identification and ticket. And the resolution was that I got home, right? Somehow they didn't check anything. So you see those five uh, elements are in that story that I just told you. Another important uh, word for you to know is the word denouement. It's a, you know, it's French, obviously, or comes from French. And what that is, the final resolution or clarification of a dramatic or narrative plot. Or if we were thinking about Sonata Allegro form, it would be the, the re recapitulation or a coda at the end of the recapitulation. Events following the climax of a drama or novel in which such a resolution or clarification takes place. The outcome of a sequence of events, the end result. So we can look here at some graphs. So we've got the exposition, action rises to a climax, then falling action after the climax. That's the aftermath to the denouement, right? This is a similar one, but with a different time frame. In other words, in this first one, the exposition and the denouement are the same time the amount of time to the climax is the same as the falling action, right? So you're looking at this in a, a, a temporal or time-based plane. And you could, even though there's five parts of this, you could think of this as a tripartite structure, the exposition, the climax, and the denouement in the background scheme of things. But in this one, it takes longer to get to the climax. 
and then the falling action to the resolution conclusion is less time. Right? So that's called the plot pyramid, and here's another drawing of it. Now, the shape of a story. If you look at this, right, this is different because it's got these peaks and valleys before the climax. This is the intensity, and this is the duration. And you can see that this is kind of a structure that you can follow. You know, this might be 60 seconds, and then it might take you 45 seconds to get to here, and then maybe 15 seconds to get to... Like, let's say your piece is just a few minutes long, right? 15 seconds to get to here, and then maybe another 20 seconds up here, and then maybe 10 seconds here, and then maybe 30 seconds here, and then maybe a minute to bring it down, and then out another 30 seconds. Now, what's interesting about this is if you take a look at those t random times that I just made up there, that's a certain pacing. And that will affect the listener in a certain way. If you change the duration but have the same, in the same inflections that reach the same dynamic levels at all these points, but you, let's say instead of this being 30 seconds, this is 2 minutes. And let's say instead of this being 15 seconds, this is 90 seconds. And you know, you know what I'm saying? So that let's say we draw this out so that this whole thing is like maybe seven or eight minutes long instead of three minutes long. So that's going to affect the listener in a different way. And it's, it's more difficult to keep somebody's attention for that long than it is for something shorter, right? Especially now that most people that are young now, they grow up with, attention, their attention spans have developed differently due to modern media and the effect on the developmental brain. And that started with MTV, and it's really quick now, where if you don't get somebody right in the first few seconds, they're just going to click off and go to something else. Learning how to make things develop over a longer period of time, I wouldn't say it's a lost art, but it's certainly not a pop popular art. Hey, Pete. Yes. Uh, just a question. So, I mean, depending on what the art form is, you can have like a book which has multiple stories in it or a film which has multiple stories. So it's not just one story. Um, and would you follow the same path like per story? Well, what I would say is that um, I'm introducing this concept, right? So I'm trying to keep it simple so that people can grasp this because I think that this for most students that have been playing, you know, most like if you're if if you're listening to pop music, or if you're listening to um, if you're a jazz student and you've been learning your standards, or 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 that kind of a thing, right? You're I don't want to make give too, I don't like to give too much information. Like I haven't taught you guys everything there is to know about Pro Tools MIDI. I've taught you about 20%. I've taught you what I thought is the most, most um, useful 20%. Um, there's so much more to learn, but I feel like I've got a certain amount of time to do that, all this work in and to give you the most important things first. And just the things, even when you look at the Pro Tools GUI, there's things I haven't talked about yet because you don't need to know that right now. You know, um, so I just feel like when I'm introducing this, I want to try to keep this, which is a very complicated, complex, and deep concept. I want to try to keep it simple for people to understand. So yes, there are multiple storylines, and let's say you're writing an opera or a Broadway play or you know a Broadway musical, right? Yes, you can think of each song as having an arc, and then the overall arc of the three-hour, two and a half-hour bit, and you can have all these sub, sub, sub moments within all that and how that all lines together right but we're talking about a final project that's going to be a few minutes long <laughs> yeah. yeah understood appreciate that thank yeah. you yeah sure right so here's another way to look at it so these are all how do you how do you make this into music right that's a, a question
I'm actually going to pop that PDF into the chat room so you could all, anybody who wants to, can download it. Actually, I'm going to do two. Oh, okay, open. And then I'm going to do a second one. And a third one. All right. So So your final project has material that other people created that you are going to transform into something different, whether your transformation is just your orchestrations and your arrangements, whether you reassemble the material into something completely different, whether you change the pitch, change the timing, create harmonies, reverse things, do whatever, whatever your artistic bent is, you have found material that you are going to assemble onto a timeline and make work with some of your own creation, some of your own music that you create, right? So, give me just one second here. So everybody knows what a collage is, right? But there's a term in art called an assemblage. Let's actually before we do assemblage, let's do let's do found object. So found objects, this is a, a type of art sometimes referred to by the French term for object Auger, well, found object, Auger Trouvé, may be put on a shelf and treated as works of art in themselves, as well as providing inspiration to the artist. Henry Moore, for example, collected bones and flints, which he seems to have treated as natural sculptures, as well as sources for their own work. Found, option, found objects may also be modified by the artist and presented as art, either more or less intact as the data and data, which is a art form from the early 20th century and surrealist artist, Marcel Duchamp, uh, ready-mades or as part of an assemblage. So let's just do this for, for, give me one second. So Duchamp is very famous for one, <laughs> for one piece of artwork. And there it is. It's the first one that comes up. A urinal, right? Fountain, 1917. So all he did was just write something on this and he put this up and this was what he considered to be... That, uh, Paul, those docs are in the chat, are, are in the chat. Actually, I, yes, I, I actually, I have the same songs, but I actually add a little bit more as I come across... Uh, as I come across new material to add, you know what I mean? So um, I think this year there might be some extra, a couple of extra bits I haven't assigned before because I found some other uh, uh, isolated instruments and tracks that uh, I didn't have before. But the Radiohead track, uh, I've been assigning that every semester and then I've been adding to the, to the, uh, to the, to the pot of gold, <laughs> so to speak. Okay. So Picasso was one of the originators. So let's take a look at this other PDF I have here, assemblage. So, you know, Picasso was an amazing, amazing, very important uh, painter. So this is right from 1914, where he's finding stuff and putting it together to create a piece of art. So Picasso's use of assemblage 
which is kind of what you're doing with your remixes as an approach to making art, goes back to his cubist constructions, three-dimensional still works, works that he began to make from 1912. So an early example of this is his still life, 1914, which is made from scraps of wood and a length of tablecloth fringing glued together and painted. Scraps of wood, tablecloth fringing, all glued together and painted, right? So some scraps of wood and some of the wood has some carving in it. And here's your fringe right here. Right, here's uh, Kurt Schwitters. He's got a metronome with an eye with a paper clip. Let's uh, go here. So let's do, so this is, the, this is a larger picture of the Picasso. This is a, a collage that Picasso made. So there's some stuff that he did, all the black lines, this word here, this kind of crescent or C, these lines here. But then he's got, I'm not quite sure what this is, but he's got paper that he cut out, right? He's got a newspaper here, a newspaper there. So it's a combination of things he created along with everyday objects. And here we can see a sculpture with all sorts of found objects arranged in a way that has a structure to it. Here's another one. Right? So this type of artist goes out and collects materials. And, they, they, you know, they typically need a place to... Um, store their materials because they collect a lot and then they figure out like what's going to fit together and they play around with their materials and they maybe they paint it or they'll they'll uh, alter it by maybe welding something else to it or taking something apart let's just look at a few more right this is 1988 you could see all sorts of wheelie things here. Um, this is uh, Jasper Johns, who's a very famous new from the New York School. Um, did I meet Jasper John? No, I don't think I met him. Uh, I'm, I've met a lot of really f well known artists. Um, I wrote something for the uh, de Kooning Memorial at the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art, Museum of Modern Art. Just through my um, the time I played with Larry Rivers, I met so many people. I can't remember all of them, but J I think Jasper Johns came to some gigs, but I never actually met him. So you could see here, uh, right? He's got Mona Lisa. He's got this painting, uh, this picture, photograph, and then he's got stuff that he painted on there. Uh, Jasper John's really famous one is the American flag. So if I did Jasper John's, you'll see that. Right, you see the flag right here. He might still be alive. Okay, let's see. All right, so another New York City artist is um, Robert Rauschenberg, right? And, you know, you've got, like, American flags here. here. Um, American flags here. you got umbrellas. you got some printed stuff here. So that's a collage, right? Um, Rauschenberg lived on the Upper West Side, I think on West 96th Street in the first floor or the basement of a building up there. Here's another Rauschenberg. He's got Kennedy. I don't know what that is there. Helicopter. Finger pointing. 
Coca-Cola, American Eagle, cafeteria sign. All right, so that's just a, you know, a discussion on some, maybe some new concepts for you to think about as you're working on your final project, right? So typically what you, we do is we come up with a melody, a riff, a rhythm, and we start to develop that. But here you've got almost like found objects, all those audio files with the Beatles, with Queen, with Motown, with the Radiohead, with Stevie Wonder, all these different uh, stems with all of these performances on them. And I would, instead of thinking like a musician, I think that you should think try, like, how about like thinking like an artist? And how do you combine? Now, the difference between what th those artists are doing and what you're doing, can anybody think of the main difference? There's one difference that's between art, painting, between a painting, a, a, a sculpture, or any of those assemblages or constructions or any of that stuff, and music. There's one huge difference. Stationary versus moving? Uh, that's that's almost that that's right, but that's uh, there's a, a different way of putting it. I would say. I'd say you can look at an entire painting in about a second, where you have to listen to the entire piece of music. It takes however long the music is. Okay, so that those two are both correct, but what I would say is that music is a temporal art, meaning that with with art to really know. A, piece of art you have to study it and you have to really look at it. you can look at a piece of art in one second but you're not really going to get everything but it's it's stationary unless there are art forms that they have that, like you can go see exhibits and installations that take place over time where you're sitting in a room and maybe like you know something flashes up over here and something flashes over there and there's sound behind you Th those are those are you know those are d definite art forms but music is a temporal art form. It occurs over time. It occupies time. There's and 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 in and in that sense, it's much more like a story that we're used to seeing in a visual medium than a, like a painting or a collage. Right. The one thing, though, about those um, assemblages that's very interesting for some of them that are freestanding is that you can actually walk around it and you get a different experience depending upon whether you're in this side of it or that side of it or looking this side or looking that side. Right. So all that stuff is, is interesting. Right. So the, the, the question becomes, how can you take those concepts that we just discussed here or that I just was talking about and how can you apply them to create your own music with these found sounds and how does that work over time? How do you structure your piece so that there's a beginning, then there's time that, passage, that passes that leads to a certain point and then there's time that passes that leads to the end? Right, that's much different than I'm going to write uh, an A A B A song. It's a much different way of looking at music, and as I said earlier, that well, the amount of time it takes to get from that beginning to the climax affects the listener. If you're going from point A to point B, which is a certain dynamic level, in 30 seconds, you're going to have a lot more activity, a lot closer together than you are if it takes two minutes. So your music needs to reflect that. So if I'm going from here 
to here, and that's two minutes, I might do a few of those things where I go up, come back down, go up, come back down, right? So I'm, I'm dragging. Pete, I have a question. Down. Yeah, Paul. How much of the plan do you think you need to have in advance and how much of it is like sometimes, you know, in creative writing where you put your pen on the paper and you don't stop, just see where it goes. Yeah, stream of consciousness. Kind of medium. How much of the plan is set in, you know, beforehand? Yeah, so I'm going to answer that and I'm going to answer that in a way that I'm going to answer a lot of questions that you ask, Paul. And I, I don't mean to be a wise guy. You know, I like you. We're friends and, uh, you know, and, and and everything. But I think sometimes that I, I don't ever, ever like to have anything defining what I do. I have a loose game plan and I adjust as I'm going along developments on the ground, change what I'm doing. Now, if I'm handed a piece of film that gives me the structure, that sort of handcuffs me a little bit, but I don't try to make a definition. The only things that I do um, that I really am fairly strict about right now is the structural things to set up my session that makes the actual creation much more of a, a, an even flow, you know? So basically what I would say is that, you know, it's funny because I, I, I've, I've watched videos where Pete Townsend uh, who went to art college, um, like a lot of British rockers in the 60s did. He actually, for Tommy and Quadrophenia, he made a, he made like a, a, a whole outline that he wrote before he started writing any songs. You know, but and, and he actually has all these all this all this material that I've I've watched videos where he talks about it and shows stuff and he um you know, and, and, and but what he does do as he's, as he's going along, he finds that, oh, I'm missing something here. It's not quite working out. What's, what's the issue and how do I resolve that, right? So I feel like if you're tied down to this is the way the structure has to be exactly as the game plan is, then you're closing yourself off to possibilities to make your work even better, right? So, you know, you have a loose game plan. You know, you know, you need a beginning, you need a climax and you need an ending. Right. And so the creativity is like when you're on a road trip, I start here. I want to get to San Francisco and I'm driving the car. Right. The best part of the trip is what happens between here and there. Going to places you've never seen before, talking to people, talking to people you've never met before you know, being on roads you've never driven on before. And as you're taking your trip, uh, yeah, you know, I think I want to stay in this place because the Badlands in South, Car South Dakota look really cool and I've never seen them before. So I think I'm going to stay here an extra day and maybe I'll get there a day later, right? You know, so, so you have a, what I would say is have a loose thought in your head and then see what happens as you're going along and, and structure and, and be open to change because also what could be happening, what can happen is that you, you start working on your piece and you work for a day or two, then you put it away. But your, your, your intuition, your, your, your non-rational thinking is still working on the problem. You know, you ever stop and think, you're thinking about what that person's name is and you can't remember that guy's name or that girl's name. And then the next day it pops into your head. You stop thinking about it. Next day it pops in your head. Well, your mind's been working that whole time on trying to figure out the name. It's just that you're not aware of it and it pops into your head. So that's what I would say, Paul, if that helps out at all. It does. It does. It's like creative flexibility. Yeah. More or less. Hey, yeah. hey Pete. Yes, Andrew. Uh, I totally agree with everything you said. But sometimes when you're starting something new, sometimes you need a structure just to get going, you know, just to get you moving. I said have a loose outline, right? A loose outline of what you're going to do. You know, an idea, that, that germ, that seed. You know, but I, what I said was don't be a slave to that outline. You might write a piece of music that's two, two minutes long and you might have to move where the climax is because it might happen too early and then you've got too much downtime afterwards, which becomes a little bit boring, right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's all, um, 
it, it, you have to you, you have to keep your mind open open that's what I would say. You know, look, when, when you're a music student and you're studying music, uh, traditional music, you learn rules, 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 rules. You know, f fifth species counterpoint has to be this. When you're harmonizing, you can't double the third. You can't have parallel octaves. You can't jump into octaves in the same direction. You can't have parallel fifths. All this stuff. And then, like, you know, I do all that stuff now. <laughs> you know? I'm not tied down to that. You can't be tied down to that. But what you do at the beginning there is you learn those things as disciplines to start thinking about music in a different way than what you were trained to do, uh, well, what you, what you had been doing up to that point. So I would say that um, that this is one of the great things about working inside of a digital audio workstation like Pro Tools, like Logic, like Cubase, like Ableton, like all these things is that you can create in ways that you c would probably not have imagined were it not for the technology, right? So if you think about where all this started and you go back into the 1960s and you look at somebody like Steve Reich, who was one of the creators of systems music, minimalism, whatever you want to call it, he would tape something, right? And then he'd copy the tape onto another piece of tape and then he'd make a loop and he'd make the loops be the same length and he'd play them on two tape machines at, and he'd start them at the same time. Boom. And they were supposedly both going at the same speed. But what would end up happening typically is that one would be a little bit faster or slower than the other tape machine and those loops would start out in sync and they get gradually out of sync with each other so that the time would almost seem like it was turned around, you know? And um, he discovered that that was something that he would import and incorporate into his written music, that whole concept of shifting time around. And... And it's interesting. Actually, I could, uh, I'd done a lecture um, on my YouTube channel. I think, yeah, I have this here. Uh, well, where's the Pro Tools session for that? Do I not have that anymore? No, I don't have that anymore. Okay. Um, what I would say to you is that, let's say that you, like, in, when using that concept there, right? If you, if you, let's say you're playing a piece of music and, and you have two, two instruments playing the exact same thing, like a marimba and a piano, and they're playing eighth notes. And every seven, every, every, uh, every two measures, one of the instruments drops one of the eighth, eighth notes. So that piano A is playing 16 eighth notes and just repeats that over and over again. And then piano B is playing the first 15 eighth notes exactly as piano A and leaving out the 16th. Well, it's starting its second time through that cycle on the eight, second, the last, the second half of the, uh, of beat four of bar two. So everything's been displaced earlier, one, one eighth note. Then the next cycle, another eighth note so that it starts on beat four. Then the next cycle through, it starts on the end of three. The next cycle through, it starts on the end of, it's on three, the end of two, two, the end of one, and then they synchronize back and all start at one again. You know, like uh, se seven or seven repetitions later. That has a certain kind of effect on the listener. And if you do the same thing, and maybe it's a cycle of 32 against 31, that takes a lot longer to sync up again, right? And that has a different effect on the listener. So th that, that's, you know, that's an interesting use of how technology sort of created a whole tape, tape machines and tape loops, which was the sequencing of the day, part, one of the sequencers of the day, um, created a whole style of music. All right. Any questions on that? 
you know, I, I don't, this, this class is, you know, really technical, right? Um, in my film scoring class, I talk more about creative techniques um, as well as we do anal analytics. But I'm finding that um, for this class, the, the, the online thing has been pretty good. And, you know, I'm getting a lot of material from the homework that where people I see are on top of a lot of this stuff. And what I want to impart to you are some of the ways that I think about music, which I think are a little bit different than you might have been taught. And what you, what I would say, suggest is that you take the stuff that you've been taught and that's one color and you take some of the things that I talk about and just sort of add that in, right? Not replace, but supplement. And you can pick and choose. Although for this assignment, <laughs> I'd like you to uh, start thinking about some of these things that I'm talk I've talked about here and sort of try, try to just try it, you know, see what you come up with. All right. So, uh, All right, if there's no further questions, we're going to move forward to some technical stuff. Let me open up a Pro Tools session. Actually, let me do this. Yeah, we have enough time for me to do both. So this is a piece from one of my albums. And I'm just going to play this a little bit. So this bit is, um, if we zoom in, right, we can see that it's A, A, B, A, and then it goes to C. So that's a standard form, but let's look at a few things that I've done here. Now, what I wanted this piece to do was to flow 
and grow slowly and meditatively over time. And I did a few things to expand some sections out and to truncate some sections, depending upon how I felt the music was going. So if we look right here along the green, we see that I'm at 62 beats a minute. And then right here, at this bit here, I'm at 52, then 56. Then right here, there's a measure of 5-4, five, 4-4, four, 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 a little slower, a measure of 3-4, and then a little slower, 60, a little slower than the beginning, or in the B section, and then what is that there? Fifty-four, measure of two four, sixty-two, forty-eight, right? So you could see how I'm doing all of this little subtle playing around with the time, playing around with the with the tempo, and then very subtle orchestral changes. So, like for example, the first time through, it's just right. I've got this harp. But I've got that blended with this piano, which, I, which is, uh, has a felt across the strings. The hammers are hitting the felt. And then it just blends in. And it creates an aggregate sound, right? So that's part of arranging, is adding instruments together to create an aggregate sound. And then... Uh, let's do this. Right, so before we get to the second time through the verse, I'm doing this overlapping bit where there's, there's this long... This instrument comes in before the end of the verse right here. So there's that and this, these two sounds. So I could just uh, right. So here comes the first one, and then add right here a higher pitch. Then the higher pitch goes away. Then the harmonics come in over here. Right? So you can hear I, I add all that stuff up. And then another thing I do is, uh, oftentimes, is I create different size ensembles. So we've had those pr pretty full string ensembles. Then in this section here, right, I've layered four different solo cellos. So if I were to solo, this is one, one of them. Here's the second one. Here's the third one. And the fourth one. Right, so you can hear they each have a little bit different timbre. And then what I did was I panned them left to right. And they really, you can't hear it on Zoom because it's mono, but it really has a really nice spread to it. But that has a much different sound. It's much more intense than having a large section. Lots of reverb, too. Right, so that's just some of the uh, little tricks I do with orchestration. And, you know, how that relates to what we were talking before is that's part of I think of these instruments as though they're characters in a play or, or, or a drama unfolding, right? And how they, how they start out and how they move forward and how they develop moving forward. So in other words, a really small example of that was back here, right here. 
right? I had this so soft string start, and then as time on well, uh, I have this soft string start, and then as time unfolds, I layer this higher string, which is a complement to it, in, and then that comes out for a second, and this gets thicker. And then once this has established itself as doing a certain thing, I bring in these higher, higher strings again. They're like string harmonics, right? In uh, with a dyad, they're two notes at a time to complement this. Like that doesn't sound as good as that. Right? So those are just some subtle ways to, 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 to have your story unfold. You can help use your orchestration to help with that. Um, yeah. Okay, let me close that. I just wanted to briefly go over that. Uh, let's do four stereo instrument tracks plus two Stereo aux inputs plus one stereo master fader. All right, so I want to talk today about master faders. Now, the master fader should be the lowest, the bottom of the rung on your session, just like this here, right? So, what a master fader is, it's like the overall control of your entire um, audio, right? and everything goes through it. So while I don't really use the master, um, I, I, I work a little bit differently than this, but I wanna show you this first because it's a little bit more complex the way I work. Um, and the master is gonna be very helpful for us in terms of gain staging. Now, if we look at Pro Tools, right? Pro Tools for metering. Let's see, I'm blocking this. So if I move this here, only has this tiny little output meter and it doesn't tell you anything. It just lets you know green, yellow, and red. Well, what does that mean? That doesn't, the only thing that you really, and red means distortion. So I typically have on my desk here, I got this little thing, right? And this tell, I, I, put a plug-in into the um, master fader and all the sound, I see everything here. I see my frequencies, I see my overall loudness, I see my, my panning structure here. And I just leave this on my desk at all times and it's always on and as I'm working, I'm watching that. And it really helps me uh, to make sure that my gain structure is good. But alternatively, you can, um, Add something like this, which is a plugin from Waves, which does something similar. But then you have to have it open all the time and it gets in the way. And this costs money. So there's a plugin in our EQ that comes with Pro Tools called EQ7, EQ37, seven, seven band EQ. Now we're not going to be using this as an equalizer, but this has one thing in it that's very helpful. So this is almost like a hack for something that we need that we don't want to spend money on. And what this has, and let me zoom in, is an input and an output meter with numbers, right? So what I want you to do when you're working is to Add a stereo in your track, a stereo master fader at the bottom of your track and insert this EQ37 band. And as you're working, open this up and look at it and play it at the loudest sections and make sure that your loudest sections 
are at about minus six. They can go over a little bit, no problem. They can, they can go under a little bit, no problem. But just the loudest sections should be somewhere around minus six. And then you don't want your softest sections to be too soft either, right, down in the minus 20. You want to sort of keep everything for what we're doing now in this area here, right? And you can use that as a meter hack, right? It doesn't cost you anything. You all have it in your Pro Tools, in your Pro Tools uh, plugin folder. And that's very helpful. So what do I mean by that? Can you see stereo on that, Pete? Uh, no, you cannot. There are freebies that you can download and install, but I'm just trying to stay with what's inside of Pro Tools. You know what I mean for, this, for everybody in the class. So what Ken is talking about, let me just see if I've got this installed. No, I do not have it installed here. Yeah, this company, Tal, makes a free, uh, a, f a free metering thing that you can download. But just st so, so what Ken's talking about is um, this guy here has a, 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 like lets you look at your mix and see uh, what's panned to the left, what's panned to the right, whether thing when you're recording audio, stereo audio, whether things are in phase or out of phase. And if things are panned in the middle of this guy here, which we don't have. Um, Actually, Pete, I was just asking if you could see the left and the right. Or are you seeing some mono thing? I see there's an input and output. Yeah, it's just a stereo input and output. So on that one. On the EQ7. Yeah, it does not, it does not show you both. So it's just an overall output. Right. But then, you know, if you see that something's distorting, you can also double it up with this to see which one is too loud, the left or the right. You know what I mean, Ken? But for right now, I think that just one, one little step at a time, just, you know, get used to your volumes being what, we, what I just discussed there. So what do I mean by that? All right, let's go in here and let me put in a drum plug in and I'll put an easy drummer. Let me zoom in. Uh, let me put this right down in the middle here. All right. So you could see how when I'm playing those drums really loud, you could see right here there's a couple of amber lines that hold for like five seconds. That lets you know that that's the peak. And then that disappears. So what you would have to do is bring your MIDI volume down on if that's a MIDI instrument and audio volume down or clip volume down if that's an audio file. So you can see that those are pretty loud, those drums, right? So to fix that with Easy Drummer, I don't think that MIDI volume works with Easy Drummer. Let me just take a look here. No, it doesn't. So you would have to bring the audio volume down here. And you see, I've just made that a lot softer. Now, what you have to also remember and realize is that when you've got a lot of instruments playing, the outputs of all those instruments add up. It's, 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 it's like addition, seriously. And that is, that's why it's called summing. Yeah, Mark, in the mix window... Right, but we're not working in the mix window this semester. Yes, you could see it in the mix window right here. 
right? This gives you that same thing. But then that gives you another, another window you have to have open, right? And I'm not going there yet with the mixed window. Um, I'll get into that next semester. So for this semester, we're, we're staying right here in the edit window, which is what I sort of had uh, decided for this class. And the reason why I'm not working, we're not working in the mix window is because we're doing mostly MIDI this semester, right? And we're, we're using MIDI and expression, MIDI volume expression, and all these MIDI uh, automation things. And, you know, that's sort of the way I, I work myself. I don't use the mix window that often. Um, it, it's just because I'm used to composing, and this is my palette, my tapestry. All right, so... That's one thing I wanted to talk to you about. Now, I started talking about this last week, right? And these tracks are called Augs tracks here. Now, Augs tracks are tracks that play back audio that's sent to it from another source. All right. So in other words, there are no audio clips in the timeline on these tracks. There's no instrument plug-in in this track. You have to take sound from somewhere and route it through the input of this AUGS track. Right? And you could see that when you default here, it defaults to this line that goes across like this, the volume, the output volume as opposed to an instrument track, which defaults to clips views, or an audio track, which defaults to waveform view. So we're, we, what I want you guys to do with these AUGS tracks is to use them for time-based effects, and that would be specifically delay and reverb. and there's only one, let's just say for this, for this semester that all your reverb and delay should be on an AUGS track. So the first thing you do once you get the AUGS tracks into your session and make sure that they're stereo is you want to solo safe them. And I'll show you what that's why. And you hold down the command key and click on the S and you notice that it gets grayed out. That means that the solo function doesn't work. And why that's important is that if you've got a track and you're sending a, a copy of the audio from that track using the send into the AUGS track for reverb, if you solo this track and this is not solo safe, you will not hear the reverb. If this is solo safe, you will hear the reverb. So that sounds a little confusing, but we'll talk about that in a second. So what I'm gonna do here, and we worked on this a little bit last week when we talked about reverb, is in the first one, I'm gonna name this reverb. And the second one, I'm going to name delay, or you can name it echo, whatever you want. And in our first, in our reverb, we are using um, D-verb, which is, you know, it, it's, it's good for teaching. If you're going to do this uh, more after this class is over and you're going to stick with Pro Tools, one of the first things I would suggest you do is to find a good reverb plugin and purchase it. And then for delay, we're going to go here and we're going to use uh, the mod delay three. And this actually is pretty good. I use this. Uh, this. I, uh, this is not the greatest, but this is. I. This is very useful, and I do use this because the controls are very easy and it's very easy to understand. So let me um, swap this out for a piano. second here great everything's off all right so that's a pretty dry piano right so let me play something in and let's go back to the beginning and let's do this let's go slower tempo let's go about 80 One, two, 
Oh, where's my sustain pedal? One, two, three, four. seller <laughs> hey how come that didn't record oh wait maybe it did record yes it did record okay great see so I made a mistake here um, and can I, I didn't name this piano right so this is not piano so I have to fix that with uh, option shift 3 that's the quick way to do that and I'm just going to quickly quantize that. All right. So, ooh. Hey, Pete, what is option shift three? What is the actual command? It's uh, consolidate, I believe it's called. If you look in the edit window, consolidate, option shift three. That's different than heal, Ken, right? Uh, consolidate can, creates a new a new clip uh, a new file. Is there an easy way to rename the audio files when you mess that up? Audio files is not a problem. Uh, yeah, well, you can rename the MIDI clips. You right click and then you go down to rename right here. Right, but for for the students, I think it's easy just to go Option Shift uh, Option Shift three and it renames it. I mean, you know, if you're if you're just creating a new uh, if if you're just create like. If you're just creating a new MIDI clip, that doesn't take up really that much memory. If you're going to do an audio, then you double click on it and rename it. I haven't gone through that yet. Okay, so we've got this little piano piece here, right? And we can do all sorts, we can do some cool stuff. So what we need to do for our reverb is to set, and this Chris, I'm not sure, Chris had an issue with this. So before you, Chris, so I go here. Chris had an issue because he had, uh, I guess he must have opened up a session that I sent him for something else and it changed his IO. So if you go to, so if you go here in your setup, you go to IO and you want to redo it, make the bus default, output default, and just hit default on all these. And then actually I want to rename that A1 and 2. Well, I'm going to leave A1 and 2. That's fine. And then just click OK. Now, I want to set a um, an input for the, this is my delay track with my mod delay three. And what I want to do is go here and set an input. So I go, I go to bus and select bus, the first uh, open bus, which is bus one and two. And then I'm going to right click on that and I'm going to rename. Now, if your right click doesn't work and you're using a Mac, you could possibly not have it set up correctly. And to go to set that up correctly, you would go to System Preferences, and you would go to Mouse, point and click, and then you would set up Secondary Click on the right side. All right. So now to get sound into the delay track, you're going to go here to the send column. And again, if you're not seeing the send column, you will go here and just click on this little triangle and select it. So if I don't have it selected, it disappears. If I select it, it's there. And this is why this is an important little box to know because you can customize what you're seeing depending upon where you are in the process. So if you need more screen space on your 13 inch laptop, then you might not need to see all this stuff, right? But now we're in the mixing phase or the creative phase, so it's nice to see all these things here. All right? So you can customize that and you can change it as you're working. So what I want to do is I want to use the send column. And what the send column does, it's like um, an internal cable where you can take sound and route it to another destination. So it's like taking a cable and plugging it into a like a side jack 
that sends a copy of the audio from whatever's on this track, a copy of that audio to another destination. So it won't affect the main output of the track, which is here. It will give you an additional output. And that output has to be routed to another destination. And for, for today, our destination is delay. So if I click here and go to my bus, you'll notice that it's, it says delay and it's amber. When it's amber, that means it's active. Something's routed to it. So if I click there, a mixer comes up. And just like with the reverb, I can use this mixer to send an, am a cop an amount of that copy of the audio into the delay. So let's play this. And you're hearing that second note, right? So it's just playing two notes. Okay, so that's how you get the delay over there. Now, what's delay useful for? Delay is useful for all sorts of really cool stuff. And for me, it's part of a compositional it's part of my compositional technique is using time-based effects, right? It's part of my palette of sounds. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at the a delay and the controls, and we'll have a little conversation about them. So this is Mod Delay 3, and all delays have something similar to this. It might look different. It might have different names, but they all have delay time and feedback. All right, so uh, hold on a second. Salida, what's the name of this plugin again? What we're looking at right now, Salida, that would be Mod Delay Three. Uh, let me just make sure that we're okay. So this is a stereo delay. On the left, we've got the left. What, what will happen on the left side of the stereo field. And over here, we've got what happens on the right of the stereo field. <coughs> Excuse me. Right here, we've got our input meter and our output meter. Give me one second. I need a little beverage. <clears throat> All right. So the basic deal is that the delay time is the amount of time it takes before the sound repeats. So you play a sound and then it repeats. The, diff the time amount of time between the first and second iteration of that time is considered the delay time. And it's typically measured in milliseconds, which is one thousandth of a second. And if we look here, 250 milliseconds. So let me play this bit and... Uh, let me go back. Let me turn the send up. And let me zoom in again. Whoops, sorry. And I'm gonna play this. And let me do this. Now you'll notice that right? As I bring this number higher, it takes longer for that delay to come in. So it's almost like a round, sort of like row, row, row your boat or something like that when you're singing that. That's kind of the effect that that creates. Now, uh, let me actually just turn down the right for right now. And we're just listening to the left delay. Now, so that's delay time. 
the amount of time, and then if I make it much shorter, let's say, let's say I make it, whoops. Or you can just simply type in a number. So if I make it 75 milliseconds. So it's going ba-doom, 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 right? You're getting that sort of, uh, it's almost like a, a quick slap off of a, that, that sort of like tape echo. And I'll, I'll get into that maybe next week a little bit, how you can simulate that. But let's just get these basics down. Now, let's go back up to 250, right? And the next thing to talk about is the feedback. The feedback is the number of times the sound repeats. So if I've got it at zero, which it is now, it repeats once. If I turn this up, let's say I'll turn it up quite a bit. Maybe I'll turn it up to 50 in the 50 range. I'll play it. You'll hear more than one repeat. Right. And then you'll notice that there are times where it's still repeating the first note, the second note plays. And as the first note is still repeating and fading out, because each one of these feedbacks gets a little softer, the second note starts playing. So you'll actually are adding music. You're adding sort of ca rhythmic counterpoint to your piece. So actually, let me let me let me change the tempo so that it becomes a little bit more apparent. So let's make the tempo uh, 120. It's like we're at the disco in 1978. Oh, I made it 12. Give me a break. <laughs> All right. So you can hear that there's multiple pitches repeating. So that's pretty cool. Now, let's turn the feedback down. What you can do, if you notice right here, there's something called sync. And that can click, turn it on, turn it off. And what that does is it synchronizes the tempo of the repeat can be synchronized to the tempo of your music. So I've got this set to 120 now. You know, it'll all change if I change the tempo. This changes tempo along with you. And then if you notice below here, it gives you different increments of rhythm. So if I did quarter notes, I can click there. And you can hear how that's... You're starting to get a rhythmic groove happening now. And this is one of the best parts about using delay for this type of a piece of music is that you get the delay in, you can create much more textured music. So now if I combine that quarter note with more feedback, Uh, reverb is, is very fast delays all, and it's, it sounds just like a, a, a big wash of sound and delays are distinct re repeats, Andrew and Mark, I was getting there. <laughs> um, okay. So that's kind of cool, right? Now there's one other thing that you can do. Uh, let me zoom in. And there's something here called an LPF, which stands for low pass filter. And we went over that briefly. And what low pass filters do is attenuate the higher frequencies and allow the low, pa low frequencies to pass through un uh, unaffected. And why that's really good on a delay is that gives you, that can make the sound of the delay distinct from the original sound by cutting off some of the high frequencies. And then each time the sound repeats, even more high frequencies get cut off. 
And that's, that's, that's typical of what you'd find like in an analog delay pedal, I believe, for guitar. So you can notice that I can scroll that down and I can get, you know, I can make these really drastic, right? Here we go. And you can hear as time goes on, they get darker and darker. And I don't know why my tempo changed back. Here we go. You can hear how that's much different. Right? And every time it repeats, it gets a little bit darker. So that's really a good option. And, and I do use that very often. Now, you notice that this is stereo. We haven't done anything with the right side yet which is kind of cool. So I'm going to turn... Oh, also the other thing, which I didn't talk about, I'm sorry, is when you're using it in Ascend, make sure that your wet is 100%. And then this, you can just click and drag left and right. So we've got all the same controls on the right. So what if I did a different rhythm on the right? So I take a quarter note and make a dotted quarter note and then turn our feedback up a little bit. Let's take a listen to this and also add a little bit of... Um, a little different low pass. Let's say we'll make this seventh area in that area. So that's kind of cool. You can create some, you know, really advanced rhythmic stuff from some very, very, very simple. Right? Now, the one other thing, there's two other things I want to talk about. And you'll notice here that it has link. If you click link, and any, any change that you do to one will happen to the other. So do you see how I'm, I'm changing these rhythmic values and these knobs are moving the same? Uh, you notice I, the feedback, they move. So if you want there to be equal, the same length feedback from each side, then you can just click on that link. And then the next one is there's something called modulation here. And I'm just going to tell you that if you just turn these up just a tiny bit, they'll add sort of like a little warble to the delay, which can be kind of pleasant. Here, let me turn the depth up. Right, I'm exaggerating this. That's obviously horrible. But if you bring that down, that's still a little bit too much to so bring down the depth. And let me turn the feedback down. That's really dramatic. It's a bit much. Right, you can hear there's a little tiny bit of marble there. So sometimes that's a cool effect too. Maybe just a little bit less than that. And then you could, you know, play around with this. Let's say I make this a, um, what if I made this quarter note triplets against a half note? Completely change the feel. Or if I made quarter notes against quarter note triplets.
Well, let's go back to our dotted eighth and quarter note. And then the next thing you could play around with is the groove, which sort of displaces the rhythm a little bit if you don't want it to be so perfect. And these, these are things that you can just sort of fool around with and see if you like anything, or you could just leave them alone and not bother with them as you're just getting started with this technique. Oh, okay. You got that, Ashley? Great. Thank you for helping Ashley out, everyone. Appreciate that. All right. So that's an introduction to delay. We had reverb last week, a long discussion with that. Delay. Um, I use delay on almost everything. Uh, Pete? Yes. You, do you ever use the uh, presets? But not with delay, never with delay. With reverb, I do, and then sometimes, and then I tweak from there. But not, never with delay. I know what I, I, I know what I want with delay really, really well. Yeah, and you can customize it much better and much quicker too. You know. Cool. Actually, for reverb for your assignment, I suggest that you try some of the presets: the plate, the hall, the room. I, th I think we were going to stick with those, and then you were just going to tweak those if it was too much reverb and bring it down, you know, just to get started with this stuff. Obviously, you could spend years studying how to use reverb and, uh, you know, and still not know everything there is to know about it. Um, but you guys have to just get started, and I think that using, for reverb, using some of the presets is a good way to go, and just tweaking them a little bit is a good way to go. But delay is so easy once you, you get the hang of it that uh, it's, it's, really, it, it's really cool. You ever use negative feedback, Pete? Um, no, I've actually no. I don't think I have. Let's see what that is, Ken. Negative feedback. Whoa, we're entering the twilight zone. Let me just do it on one side here. Look back to the other one and let's hear the difference. Yeah, so Mark, that, that's what it does because I never use it. So that's good. It flips the wave of the delay upside down, Ken. So, yeah, um, it puts it out of phase. Yeah. Okay, so let's try this. So if I have negative feedback, uh, so if I make both of these the same, let's see, if I, let's see what happens if I make everything exactly the same. In, well, except in verse. So let's do if I do uh, 51, 50, and then negative 50. It should cancel your delays, right? Right, and I get, let's get rid of our low pass filter, and let's sync. Let's link, and let's turn off this stuff. Uh, hold on, give me one second. Okay, I had the the right side off, um, completely dry. Okay, so what's happening, and you guys can't hear this, is that the sound is in mono. I'm hearing it in mono right in the center of my headphones, and the other ones I was hearing the piano in the center, the left delay in the left ear, and the right delay in the right ear. And right now I'm hearing everything in the center. So it's canceling out the stereo field. That's the effect that I'm getting right now. And it, it, I think that's only because you have the right side and the left side identical. Correct. Uh, I, was, I was hoping that we would get some phase cancellation and cancel out the echo completely. Yeah, weird that it's not. Yep. Um, I, do, I do talk about that next semester, a phase cancellation. I show um, how you can make a sound completely disappear by having things out of phase, but I usually teach that when we're talking about miking things in stereo, which since we're going to be online next semester in Audio MIDI 2, that'll be a little bit difficult to do. Uh, yeah. 
All right, so I think that that's quite a bit of information for today. Any questions on this? I have a question. I, I, um, go that, ahead, go ahead. Ash, no, Ashley, go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead, Ashley. Oh, I was just going to say I have a question in regards to the final project. Yes. Um, for undergrad, you said to take four of the audio files in the remix folder and make separate eight bar phrases. So is this like the audio editing project? Is that? Well, I'm, that, that would be, yeah. So, okay. So that, that's as an additional thing to taking those, those, those tracks and making a piece of music out of them. So what I would say is don't worry about that so much. You could take those tracks that are in the folder for undergraduates and see how you can work them together to create a piece of music. Okay. Okay. So and if, then and if, I'm you not... want, if you want to use some of the other tracks as well, you're perfectly welcome to try those, the ones that are for the graduate students. You don't have okay. to limit yourself. So then am I taking, so out of the four, right? Am I taking one for each? So I'm making eight bars out of the first audio file, then eight bars. Well, no, like you'll, 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 you'll use those and you'll try to fit those together to make a piece of music. Oh, okay. All right. Got as it, got opposed it. to, as opposed to audio editing. Okay. If, if that wasn't clear, okay. let me know if that, if you have any more questions, email me about that. All right. All right. Thank you. All right, Chris, your question. I was wondering about the, about the, uh, if you could talk a little bit about the playback engine, uh, it seems like I have an option of of uh, yep, got it. No it to like a Pro, uh, Pro Tools aggregate or the name yeah, of my yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, interface. Okay, okay. So the first thing is, if you go down here to Audio MIDI Setup, which I have in my dock, but that's in um, uh, if you go to Applications and you scroll way down to Utilities, you will find the Audio MIDI Setup right here. Okay, I've just got that in my doc because I access it all the time. And if you notice here, it, you go up here, there's a window where you can uh, show your MIDI studio. It's, I only have a couple things plugged into my MIDI studio right now. And then you can also show your audio devices, which is right here. So if you look right here, these are the audio devices that are hooked up to my computer right now. There's my one of my monitors, um, my monitor screen. Uh, computer monitor, there's the video switcher that I use here, the Roland video, uh, and then there's the v Roland video um, with the audio part of it. So this, the Roland video and the VR1 HD are the same thing. And then there's my Focusrite Thunderbolt that I use for class, and then there's my HD native system, which I use for regular work. And then there's Pro Tools aggregate. So you don't really, if I were you, I would actually delete Pro Tools aggregate. You, there's no reason for you to have that on your computer. But the way that that translates out is that if you go up here to setup and you go back to playback engine, you'll have this guy right here that says playback engine. And if you click on this, it will give you a list of all the things that can play back audio. And I, I have my Focusrite Thunderbolt selected now because that's what I'm using to teach class. So you, you, you have an audio interface, Chris? Oh, uh, yes. So that's the one that you should select. And if you select that, then you will, unless you have speakers hooked up to the audio interface, you'll only be able to listen back through headphones. Okay. With Pro Tools. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, great. Any other questiones? I thought that was a, uh, I enjoyed teaching that class today. I liked telling the stories of stories of stories. So on YouTube, farewell. I'm I, so this is up. I've been streaming this live, and I'm going to end that stream now. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go.